This video is sponsored by ExpressVPN. So it's that time of year again, the best movies of 2020, according to me and my own opinion. I know it may seem like not a lot of movies came out in 2020, and while it's no 2019, there were a lot of really special films that released. Originally, I was gonna break this down by like genre or theme, but then I got like six into a coming of age list before I even hit something that would have been in my top 15. So I just went back to a more traditional top 15-ish with some honorable mentions, as well as like my top, like what to anticipate that hasn't been released yet. And a lot of these movies are interchangeable depending on my mood. My list has even changed in like the past two weeks since I recorded the Best of 2020 Intercut podcast with Zach and Art. I just really suck at making lists, especially this year. But just to get it out of the way, I will say that my number one choice is technically a cheat, but also very acceptable. So I'll just say it now so I can keep the actual list fresh. But for the second year in a row, my number one movie is Portrait of a Lady on Fire because you. Okay, sorry, that was really aggressive. But this technically only released to the public in 2020, even though I saw it in 2019, but it still counts! Celine, Adele, and Natalie are queens, and everything about this movie is stunning. There's so much to talk about with this movie, but it takes a big look at the place of women in society, their responsibilities, how a lack of societal power may actually give you more freedom in ways, while also weaving in a grand and tragic love story with notes of Greek mythology that comes back to hit us with an ending not once, not twice, but three times with the gut punch. The number 28 will never be the same again, but let's get into the rest of the list. So first up are some things to keep on your radar. A lot of my favorite movies that I saw in 2020 don't actually release until later this year. So I decided to make this top three of the ones that I'm most excited to watch again. So those are the ones that I would probably promote to you. Also, I'm cheating. I just forgot one. Zola. Zola's a really interesting movie that everyone should watch. I think it loses it in the ending, but it's based on an actual Twitter thread. I'm very interested to see what they do with one particular scene, which was basically just like a bunch of full frontal. It was a Wang montage. I'll just say it. It was a montage of Wang. I'm assuming they're going to use like emojis because that would fit really well to the theme. Definitely worth checking out, but we'll get into the actual top three list that I had written down here. And first up is Shiva Baby. Now Art included this on his top 10 list because he said it was coming out later this month, maybe March, but I can't find an actual wide release date for this anywhere. So correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe I'm just bad at finding that. But holy shit! Shiva Baby is about a college girl attending a Shiva and dealing with all the questions we hate in family situations while we're still trying to figure out life. Like, did you get a job? Are you going to grad school? How's college going? Are you getting good grades? All the kind of questions that make you dread family engagements. <laughs> Things derail even more as she's constantly being overshadowed by her ex-girlfriend and then her sugar daddy shows up. It's chaotic, it's stressful, but it's so full of heart. Oh my god, Molly Gordon stole my my heart like a little bit. Dinner in America will likely be the most polarizing choice on this list. It has a bit of a rocky first 20 minutes, but once it kicks off, it's just so simultaneously aggressive and cute. It's a quirky little punk rock coming of age story about learning to accept yourself and fuck anyone who tries to make you feel bad for it. And then finally is Nine Days, which is a movie that has stuck with me so profoundly since I saw it last January. I really wish I'd been able to watch this again throughout the year, but I gross cried in a theater with a bunch of critics and industry people who are are oftentimes the most jaded of the film viewing world. But this is the kind of movie that if it doesn't resonate with you on some kind of emotional level, you probably won't enjoy it at all. But I found that it was a fairly unique premise of a man who conducts interviews with human souls to determine who has the best shot at making it through life, because he can then go on and watch these different souls that he's put on earth living through their lives. So this obviously turns into a massive emotional examination of what it truly means to live. And as you all know, I'm a huge fan of the Give a Shit movies, so I'm super excited to see this again. Great performances from Winston Duke and Zazie Beetz and honestly everyone involved. And then the things I didn't even bother try ranking this year because I've talked about them so much before because I saw them in 2019, but then they only released in 2020. First up would be To the Stars, which is a great coming of age story from a small town America in the 60s where our lead character forms a friendship with a girl who's recently moved in from the big city following some of her inappropriate behaviors. That means she's gay. Big Time Adolescence, the better of the Pete Davidson movies this year that points out that sometimes the people we idolize are losers that need us more than we need them. And The Lodge, one of my favorite horrors of the year. I'll have appropriate links down below so you can check 
things out about those if you want. Now before we get into the list, there's obviously a lot of movies I didn't see. So if there's things that are missing that you think should be here, um, you can check my letterbox to see if it's something that I watched and maybe I just didn't like it enough to include it or I didn't have the chance. I know the big ones are Nomadland and The Father are two I was not able to catch. So now let's get into some honorable mentions. I found that like my top 15 to 30 were all pretty interchangeable and then everything below that was pretty interchangeable as well. Maybe 30 is going a little bit outside that bounds, but a lot of these movies could switch around quite a bit. So in my worst movies of 2020 video that I will make because people seem to like those, I'm going to try to make some positivity to that too by pointing out some of the other movies that you could check out that were kind of like unexpectedly good in some way. Not that they were amazing, but they're like, hey, if you like something like this, you might like this. But for the honorable mentions, first up, we have Swallow, a deeply uncomfortable thriller about a woman who starts eating progressively more dangerous objects as she feels she's losing control of her life. The Climb, which is a buddy comedy where sometimes the people we've known the longest suck the most. I don't think it does enough with the conversation about toxic and abusive friendships, but it's still worth a watch. Yes, God, Yes takes a look at the extreme hypocrisy in religion when it comes to sexuality and expression and how it'll condemn people for the same behaviors they engage in. The Gentleman, which wasn't without flaws by any means, but it still ended up being such a fun watch for me. I love the way the story was actually told as it weaved us through the different characters and their involvement. There's some shit language issues, but as Henry Golding pointed out, gangsters aren't particularly concerned with being good people. Now on to what I guess is my top 15, but even as I'm, I just, I don't know. I think, yes, this works. This is a top 15. I don't know if the order is the best, but this is my top 15 as we go with it. So the first one's actually a cheat and it's actually the Small Axe series by Steve McQueen, which is actually five separate movies, but each deals with similar themes of racial injustice told through a variety of different lenses in the 1960s to 1980s London. Very much worth your time. Some of these are real stories and others are just based on very real things that affected and continue to affect these communities. Next up is The Devil All the Time, which is a movie that just kind of immediately stuck with me after watching it. It's literally all about these terrible people and the terrible things they do that wrap around the entirety of a young man's life and family. Some things set in motion before he was even born. But somehow through all the tragedy that befalls his life, it left me feeling a certain sense of peace when I finished it. It's based on a book that I've been going through and I'm really tempted to make a full video. It's non-linear as it goes through its tail and I honestly think it was just a few choices away from being absolutely spectacular. So I definitely recommend it. And my shitty review is, <clears throat> you can take the vampire out of the Pattinson character, but not the affinity for teenage girls. Bad Education is actually something I forgot released in 2020 because I saw in 2019. This tells the real life story of a massive embezzlement scheme that was uncovered in a school district where the superintendent has worked incredibly hard to build up all his students to success. This is a movie where a curated exterior starts to peel away to the reality beneath solid crime drama with an all-star cast. And it was written by someone who actually grew up in one of those school districts. I'm thinking of ending things. It's an absolute mind trip of a movie. At one point I was gonna make an analysis analysis on it and talk about how it was adapted by Charlie Kaufman from the original novel, but I think I might have missed my window there. But this is a movie that is just loaded with existential horror, discomfort, and dread, and what already seemed like an awkward trip to visit a new boyfriend's parents quickly gets even more so as the multiple layers of what's actually happening trickles through. This is not a casual viewing experience. Spree is something that I have an entire video about that I'll have linked below, but this is one of the most uniquely filmed movies I've ever seen that takes a look at exactly how far people will go to gain online fame. Starring Joe Keery, Spree is an off-the-wall thriller shown through a live stream feed, the chat, and security cameras as his deluded massacre continues. And honestly, it's probably not too far off what people would actually do to gain some kind of internet fame, so... It's also a cautionary tale. Soul is another movie that I've already talked about. If you missed my video, which a lot of people did, I urge you to check it out. Linked below because this is the Pixar movie for adults. All Pixar movies are for adults if you want them to be. Maybe not all of them. Maybe not Cars 2, but... This, this one is. Soul follows Joe Gardner, a middle school teacher who finds himself traveling to the great beyond after falling down a manhole just as he got a chance to perform on stage. It reminds us that we all have our passions, we all have goals and dreams, but life isn't about having one defining purpose that invalidates life if you don't achieve it. Life is beautiful, it matters, and there's wonder in simply living it. The Wolf of Snow Hollow is the follow-up to Thunder Road, written, directed, and lead acted by Jim Cummings, and it's one of the most unique werewolf stories I've ever seen 
scene. It's a horror comedy, which is one of my favorite genres, about a cop dealing with mounting paranoia in a small mountain town after bodies continue to turn up dead in gruesome ways after each full moon. I had a ton of fun watching this, and I definitely think it's an underrated gem from 2020. Palm Springs falls into what I like to call the post-adolescence coming-of-age movie. I feel like a lot of people in their late 20s and early 30s are often left feeling lost and like so many things don't matter. And movies like this legitimize those sentiments in a way that lets you know, hey, it's okay to not have it all figured out. Starring Andy Samberg, Kristen Milotti, and J.K. Simmons, this is a hilarious movie about the mistakes we make and how it's never too late to change things. It also takes two of the most overused film concepts, the time loop and the rom-com, and builds them into something so much more than both. It'll make you laugh, it'll make you think, and in the end, it'll hopefully help you realize that life is worth giving a shit about. So enjoy it. Black Bear was trippy as all hell, and I truly believe it was the perfect role for Aubrey Plaza. Not only does it play into the skills she has inherently that we're used to seeing, it also lets her explore a side of her career that we've never seen. There was literally a, a joke she made after we watched it when she said filming this movie ruined her life. Yeah, kind of turns out she wasn't joking. Like there, there's a scene that was just so emotionally hard for her to film that they ended up having to bump up in the schedule because of rain. And it was just so emotionally taxing that it kind of broke her a little bit, if that gives you any indication of how far this movie's gonna go in certain areas. There's a lot of ways this movie can be interpreted, but it so often disorients the viewer right along with the characters. The beginning of the movie seems to be just Aubrey Plaza's character preying on social conventions that cause people to react or respond in certain ways, and then immediately throwing them off by not responding in the expected way. And if that sounds sociopathic, it is. I don't want to say too much because I feel like this movie is best watched when you go in as fresh as possible. And fuck it, we're going with Happiest Season. It's not a perfect movie by any means, but the gays deserve a holiday rom-com and one that stars Kristen Stewart, Mackenzie Davis, and Aubrey Plaza is the one that I deserve. Also, what a great time this movie was on the internet. I loved all the memes. I loved the Twitter threads, the debates, the team Rileys. It was all great. I have a full video on this link down below if you want to know more, but... I, yeah, it was fun. Beasts Clawing at Straws is a movie that was completely off my radar until my pal Art mentioned it, but it's another crime thriller with multiple characters and stories that all move to converge into one. This is a Korean film adaptation of a Japanese crime novel, which sadly hasn't been translated into English because I would read the hell out of it. It ends up feeling like a blend of early Coen brothers, Guy Ritchie and Tarantino, and I mean that in the best possible way. This was super gripping from start to end, and it just kind of leaves you with this feeling of, is this cycle just going to continue. Next up is Promising Young Woman. Again, I've got an entire video about this on my channel, but it's an extremely dark comedy psychological revenge thriller that starts off with our lead Cassie pretending to be drunk in bars to trap men who would take advantage of her. This builds into her becoming an avenging angel type character on a mission to hold people accountable for something from her past. Amazing cast all around. Bo Burnham did great. Laverne Cox is great, but it is really all hinging on Carrie Mulligan's amazing performance. There is a scene at the end of the movie that's very difficult to watch. Some people really hate the direction the movie goes in at the end, but for me, it's a definite recommend. Never Rarely Sometimes Always is something I've done an entire podcast on, but it's the gut-wrenching film of a teenage girl trying to get an abortion. And if you're looking for it to take some kind of moral standing, it won't. It's a very fly-in-the-wall experience showing exactly how difficult it can be to get these services, bringing us exactly through all the different steps and hurdles that need to be overcome. From unqualified doctors to not having services available where you live, how to get where you need need to be. The performances of our two leads, Sidney Flanagan and Talia Ryder, were spectacular and so much is said in this movie without saying anything at all. The conversation that ties into the title is gut-wrenching and invasive, yet we're still given so little info on the specifics of her larger situation. Overall, gorgeous film by Eliza Hittman. Then we have Minari, which is one that isn't technically out yet, but there is a release date that's coming out in early February, so I figured why not put it on the list. There's a lot of news circulating this movie recently because the Golden Globes chose to put it in the foreign language category, even though it is a combination Korean-English film, and it is literally very much about the pursuit of the American dreams and an American family in America that when they move to a new American city, they move from a different American city. I get that it's technicality rules, but the same thing happened to The Farewell and I don't like it. But the movie itself is a beautiful story of a Korean family trying to make it in small town America after moving to Arkansas from the West Coast. The story largely follows the son David as he adjusts to his new life and spending time with his grandmother who's recently come over from Korea. And it was just so tender in its delivery of human resilience in the face of extreme 
hardship and tragedy. I felt that it was a really intimate look at this life from someone who lived it, and uh, Steven Yeun is just fantastic in it. Sound of Metal was one of the most impactful movies I saw this year. Riz Ahmed delivers a heartbreaking and amazing performance as a metal drummer who starts to lose his hearing and how deeply that affects his life. It's a beautifully tragic film that captures how devastating it can be to try and recapture the things that make you the happiest, but never being able to fully get it back. When music was your whole life, when touring has been your salvation, and it's the thing you do every day with the person you love the most and it's suddenly taken away from you so completely, it's heartbreaking. There's a really nice parallel with his new behavior and his former drug addiction, but the movie never cheapens anything by falling into cliches. And the sound design in this is spectacular. It quite literally pulls you into exactly what Ruben is experiencing. When he doesn't understand the sign language, we're not being shown what those people are saying until he does. Can't say enough positive about it, it's stunning. And then a movie that's been rising up the ranks and when I watched it again over the holidays really just cinched it for me, it's Kajillionaire. I love Kajillionaire the more I see it. This was another of my top Sundance films that's just carried throughout the year, and it's such a quirky story about family dynamics and human connection. Directed by Miranda July, starring Evan Rachel Wood, Gina Rodriguez, Deborah Winger, and Richard Jenkins, Kajillionaire tells the story of a con artist family that have spent their entire life just skimming and splitting things three ways. The scam runs so deep that they named their daughter Old Dolio after a homeless man who won the lottery in hopes that he would leave his fortune to to her in his death. They live in an unused office space that literally bubbles over every single day because of the business next door, which is the only reason they get it so cheap, and they still don't pay the rent on time. When one of their scams picks up Melanie, a young woman who seems excited by their schemes, Old Dolio is completely thrown off by her. Not only are they from completely different walks of life, but Melanie also gets the comfort and affection from her parents that she's never received. So when Melanie starts to chip away at Old Dolio's shell, she doesn't know how to react. In fact, sometimes she's just discomforted because she doesn't know what to do with it. She's never actually received any kind of intimacy, not even in the familiar sense. She's very uncomfortable with any kind of human contact because she's never gotten it. No hugs, no comfort, no encouragement, not even pancakes. Everything was just about that next scam but not with Melanie. It's funny, it's charming, it's adorable, I love it. The performances are all great. It's, when it winds into its conclusion, I'm just, mm, I love it, it's so good. It's cute, it's worth it. How did Carson Runquist put it? There's so much to love in this movie about being loved. That says it all. So that's pretty much it. Again, don't put too much stock in this order because depending on how I'm feeling or what I'm looking for in a movie, a lot of these move around quite a bit. But I do still think this was an absolutely incredible year for movies. Let me know what some of your guys' favorite movies of the year were. I can also do one of these lists for TV if you want, though I did just do a podcast with the Intercut podcast and I don't think my list changed at all from that. So that one's a pretty safe one to watch compared to this. I am gonna do like a worst of or just like most disappointing list because you know, like that's people like the negativity, sadly, but I will try to put some positivity in that as well. But I get that we're already pretty much at the end of January, but I do just want to say thank you for the amazing 2020. Uh, it was such a bad year for pretty much everyone in the world, and in a lot of ways it really sucked, but it was also the year that I've been able to do this as a full-time job, and that's all thanks to you guys just watching these videos. So again, just truly thank you. But because this is what pays the bills, a message from our sponsors. So I listed a lot of great movies here today. You might find yourself trying to watch them only to see that they're not available in the country you live in. Well, do I have the solution for you with today's sponsor, ExpressVPN. By connecting to one of their many secure server locations, ExpressVPN allows you to change your location so you can take advantage of region locked content. So many great movies and series from 2020 may not be available where you live, but they are available on those same streaming services in other countries. Things like Spree, Yes God Yes, and Steve McQueen's Small Axe series. Wanna watch Palm Springs but don't have access to Hulu? Well, surprise, it's available on the Canadian Prime video. I used ExpressVPN a ton when going through 2020 releases. It gave me the ability to watch Sound of Metal, which ended up being one of my favorite movies of the year. And for those of you that are missing The Office, guess who still has it? That's right, Canada still has it. It's super fast, available on all your devices, and I never run into buffering issues. So if you want to try out ExpressVPN for yourself and find out how you can get three months free, head on over to expressvpn.com slash Jedi or click the link in the description below. So thanks as always for watching. Thank you so much to my Patreon supporters. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Leave a like on the video if you're into that kind of thing. I hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay and we'll catch you all later.